Good morning and welcome to Pittsburgh City Council's public hearings for Saturday, July 10th, 2021, relative, relative to bills 2021-1652, 1653, 1654, and 1655. Would a clerk please read the title of the bill? Bill number 1652, resolution appropriating federal American rescue plan funding for a four year period from January 1, 2021 through December 31st, 2024, as recommended by the mayor and the Pittsburgh Recovery Task Force, as the total cost not to exceed the amount received from the United States Department of Treasury. Bill number 1653, resolution amending resolution number 645 of 2020, entitled resolution making appropriations to pay the expenses of conducting the public business of the city of Pittsburgh and for meeting the debt charges thereof for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2021, so as to reopen the 2021 budget to account for American Rescue Plan funding. Bill number 1654, resolution amending resolution number 646 of 2020, entitled Resolution Fixing the Number of Officers and Employees of the City of Pittsburgh for the 2021 fiscal year and the rate of the compensation thereof and setting maximum levels for designated positions so as to reopen the 2021 budget to account for American Rescue Plan funding and bill number 1655. Resolution further amending resolution number 647 of 2020, effective December 23rd, 2020 as amended, entitled resolution adopting and approving the 2021 capital budget and the 2021 community development block grant program and the 2021 through 2026 capital improvement program by increasing various line items by $57,349,840 with funding from the American Rescue Plan. Thank you very much. Um, for the record, we are joined by Councilwoman Gross, Councilman Coghill, Councilman Krause, and Councilman Wilson, as well as President Smith, and others will be joining us as we go through this. Before we go to our public speakers, we've asked our budget director, Mr. Urbanic, to just give a brief overview of the bills on hand. Good morning, uh, I'm Joe Urbanic, uh, City Council Budget Director. Um, I will uh, start by giving a brief description of where we were and, and where we're headed. Um, our story begins, I guess, December 31st in uh, 2019. In December 2019, we passed a, a budget of $608 million in revenue projections and very close to that in uh, expenditures. Um, the actual revenue that we re received in that 2020 uh, budget year was only $531 million. Uh, of course, as we all know, in March, of 2020, everything got shut down due to COVID. Uh, so we're, uh, we were in a situation where I had to make a decision regarding layoffs uh, and other cost reductions. A lot of cost reductions were achieved, uh, but smartly they, uh, we did not lay off or reduce uh, services except for those things that we had to, and, uh, you know, such as our meetings and, and some public place issues. Um, expenditures still were there and, uh, and went up, in fact, because you had to deal with uh, COVID. We ended up, uh, as I said, the actual revenues were $532 million. We uh, spent over $587 million. Uh, and in order to deal with that gap, we used $55 million from our fund reserve. And thank gosh that uh, our city uh, had been fiscally responsible uh, over the past several years since Act 47, uh, we were able to amass a cushion that let us get through uh, that portion of time. Uh, fast forward us to the uh, 2021 budget uh, in December uh, of 2020. Uh, there was mass uncertainty uh, as far as being able to receive any relief. Uh, that wasn't, uh, that didn't happen uh, till February. Uh, there were a lot of, uh, there, there was some uh, proposals on the table federally. Uh, and uh, lucky for us in uh, um, 
February, Congress passed the, uh, the American um, Rescue Plan and President Biden signed it into law on March 11th. Had we not done that in that 2021 budget, uh, we would have needed to uh, lay off over 600 employees, 20% of our workforce, make many other draconian cuts to services. Uh, and uh, you know, thank gosh, we were able to get that, uh, that additional funding, um, which took place. Now, they allocated $200 uh, billion to state, local, and tribal governments. The city's share of that was determined to be $335 million. That is to be dispersed over two years. 167.5 million in 2021 and 167.5 million in 2022. The majority of those funds uh, not only need to be contracted, but need to be completely uh, spent by uh, December 31st, 2024. One of the good things council and the administration did was to create a trust fund. This will provide for better transparency and accounting. Um, and the, uh, in order to spend this 167 million or insert in our budget this year, uh, as well as the monies next year, the treasury department created rules and formulas on how the monies could be, uh, could be spent and how much money we could spend. Um, so the administration on his proposal uh, that's before council divided those funds into uh, the following categories here. One is lost revenue. The other, uh, which they're a total of that 367 and a half million, there's $232 million that will be allocated in that uh, category. Um, they've also uh, allocated money to community public safety, $2 million, community uh, health, $10 million, negative economic impact, which is a category that uh, was also uh, established by the uh, Treasury guidelines, $70 million in that category. Broadband uh, is an allowable use. Uh, the administration is proposing $468 million over the uh, four years for broadband. Uh, water, um, one of the things that I, I reviewed again uh, in reading the Treasury guidance, uh, the authorities and our subdivisions uh, that we have, such as the ELA, the Parking Authority, and the uh, Water and Sewer Authority are not able to apply. We need to, needed to apply on their behalf. Um, so in this uh, proposal here, we're taking care of the, uh, the Water Authority, and then there's also funding going towards the um, uh, Equipment Leasing Authority, but there's no direct funding allocated here for the Pittsburgh Parking Authority. Lost revenue, uh, as the treasury formula dictates that the city could receive uh, a certain amount of funding to replace revenue lost by the pandemic. Those funds are mostly for operating expenses and enable the city to restore payroll to avoid layoffs, as well as needed positions to operate the, uh, the city, uh, as well as to provide uh, all the services our residents are accustomed to. The total al allocation of lost revenue was $232 million. Of that, $181 million is allocated directly into the operating budget. Another $57 million is allocated to the capital budget. The lost revenue category has the most flexibility after all, all of our uh, expenses are taken care of. It's meant for those things that the city would normally spend money on in its course of business. The other categories include, uh, as mentioned before, community safe, public safety, community health, negative economic impact, broadband water, and then they've allocated $300,000 towards administration. That's a contract to make sure that we're doing things right with Meyer Dussel that was passed uh, earlier this month. Uh, so total on the proposed allocations, uh, City capital will be, as I mentioned, $57 million, and those are for specific capital projects for the city. There's another um, 73 or $74 million approximately that's gonna be allocated to the URA. The majority of that is for that negative economic impact funds. And those are things that affected our small business, 
uh, the, the guidelines and final guidance, uh, particularly uh, concentrated on hospitality, entertainment, uh, those uh, industries that took uh, some largest hit. Uh, it's not necessarily um, allocated towards those or needs to be allocated specifically towards those, but those are the uh, categories that they, uh, they sort of emphasized in the guidance. Uh, there's another $20 million uh, that will go to the PSA, the PWSA, uh, Pittsburgh Water and Sewer Authority, uh, that's uh, needed to be used or proposed to be used for uh, lead abatement and water. There's also, uh, it was mention of uh, doing uh, lead paint abatement as well too throughout the city. Uh, the other category that they had on there, which has some flexibility on it, was the uh, One Pittsburgh Guaranteed Income Program. Uh, and there was $2.5 million to run a pilot for that. But the total city operating uh, would be um, $181.3 million. So that accounts for the $335 million um, over the four-year period. And you know, reflected into our budget, uh, we're adding an additional $57 million in the capital and uh, $600 the, the um, revised budget for us uh, will increase from the $560 million to $603 million for um, 2021. And uh, I can, uh, and I would rather not, but if you want me to, I can read through each one of the capital projects um, yeah. as well. But yeah, I, I didn't think you wanted to do that um, or the URA project. So uh, that's what we have so far. Uh, and as I said, it's a proposal that was sent over from the administration uh, that legislation will come up for discussion, I believe, on Wednesday. And if you have any questions after, or if you want to do that now, or you want to do that after, we can, uh, I'll be around to take questions. Thank you very much. Sure. Let you. the record reflect, we've been joined by Councilwoman Strasberger, as well as Councilman Burgess. We're now going to move on to our registered speaker portion. Um, once called, please provide your name and neighborhood for the record. Our first speaker of today is Mr. William Parker. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, listen. If we wanted the next four years planned by the outgoing administration, we would have reelected them again. We have until 2024 to spend this money. Let's get this right the first time so we don't have to come back and amend anything. What's the rush? Only thing that's running out of time is the outgoing administration stay in office. Where's the equity layout? Who will receive contracts? What percentage will go to black developers? It's always perceived to look good on the front end, but what about the black end? Just yesterday, city, the city revealed Move Pittsburgh, which is another example of a non-inclusive initiative. They didn't even think to include a black founder in with this mobility plan. They rather partner with out of town companies to test pilots instead of find and invest in local entrepreneurs here in Pittsburgh. Help me understand why $200,000 was given to an accountant firm to vet this proposal and nothing close to that amount was spent on advertising today's or Monday's meeting. Are we moving forward or backwards? Even Deb Gross said that there's no immediate need for some of these projects. Some have nothing to do with COVID. And if we just want to throw something out there, let's throw something out there that unites us all, like a skating rink over in Hazelwood Green, across the street from the Eliza Furnace and Three Rivers Heritage Trail. How about that? How about a Black-led tech investment accelerator that can help more people of color get involved with this emerging industry? Moving too fast will only divide us. There will be Black and white people who will feel left out. We need at least three to four more months of feedback. I find it disturbing that I'm the only mayoral candidate who's even mentioned today's meeting. Even after the city controller, Michael Lamb, who was referred as the city's top financial watchdog, spoke out and questioned this premature timing of this proposal. Just earlier this week, Councilman Krause said 
that he feels completely comfortable with voting on this. But my question to him and everybody else is, how can you feel completely comfortable without first hearing from the community? I'm asking everybody involved to hold off on voting on this proposal. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Celeste Scott. Mr. Chair, would it be possible to read the next name as well, just so people, because- Okay, of... can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, good morning. My name is Celeste Scott, and I am the Housing Justice Chair for Pittsburgh United. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment today on this legislation. So we are deeply concerned about this plan and how it has come about with no public input. We are asking for additional assistance to renters. Over half of city households rent 53%, but Pennsylvania shortchanged Pittsburgh with allocating, allocating state ARP dollars for emergency rental relief. Additional funds may be needed for the city's direct ARP allocation for rental relief that helps reduce evictions at least $36 million is what we're asking for. Um, we think homeowners are important, but we know that renters have received the brunt of the pandemic effects. So we're asking for money for renters. We know we can create a city, county, and state where people of color, poor and working class people are centered, where we make investments, where people have what they need, where our neighborhoods and priorities are not pitted against each other and all of our neighbors can thrive. We have to start by putting our money where our values are. So we're really troubled by the fact that there was no community engagement process. And we think that this money needs to be decided on by not the usual voices or the usual suspects, but by the community at large. So we're asking you to pause this vote and engage the community in a real way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Taylor Uzil, followed by Rebecca Simon. Great, thank you. Um, hello everyone, good morning council members and staff. My name is Taylor Musil and I'm health policy coordinator with the public health nonprofit Women for a Healthy Environment. And today um, we're grateful to be able to comment on the American Rescue Plan um, proposal as the Get the Lead Out Pittsburgh campaign that focuses on shining a light on lead poisoning, connecting family to resources and driving change. And we echo the comments that have already been voiced so far. Um, and we also want to bring to light that lead poisoning is an all too common 100% preventable and solvable problem. We know its impacts. Um, it impacts individuals for a lifetime manifesting as problems such as developmental delays in early life, lower third grade reading levels, and in some cases, anger and impulsivity into adulthood. Furthermore, lead disproportionately impacts communities of color, in fact, around six times more so than their white counterparts, and is concentrated in communities where maintenance is deferred in rental properties and ripple effects of redlining continue to cause disparities in access to resources. And we know exactly where to look for lead hazards. Homes built before 1978, dusty friction surfaces like doorways, aging water lines, and demolitions of older buildings. And we know the solutions. <laughs> we can test for lead hazards in homes that are most vulnerable and remediate lead hazards safely. Clean, dusty surfaces often replace lead service lines and soak demolition sites with water. These funds present a unique opportunity to jumpstart these solutions in Pittsburgh in the footsteps of cities like Philly, Lancaster, Cleveland, Baltimore, Detroit, and many others who pass lead safety measures. And Mayor Peduto's press release recently stated that proposal uh, allocates 20 million to addressing lead and water and paint. And the campaign um, absolutely supports this because in order to comprehensively prevent lead exposure for residents, all sources of lead, water, paint, dust, and soil have to be considered. In fact, paint and household dust containing lead is the most common source of exposure that has been identified when the health department responds to local um, lead poisoning cases. And in describing why Congress encouraged cities to use these funds to address lead, the Department of Tre Treasury directly stated, for children living in homes with lead paint, spending substantially more time at home raises the risk of developing lead poisoning, while screens for lead poisoning declined during the pandemic. The combination of these underlying social and health vulnerabilities may have contributed to more severe public health outcomes of the pandemic within these communities, resulting in an exacerbation of pre-existing disparities. And we think this public health and environmental justice issue should be prioritized in the budget. 
We're grateful for these hearings, but like others have already stated, we're disappointed in the lack of clarity around the timeline for approval and opportunities for public input. And to ensure that clarity is reached, we call on council to pause their vote until an equitable people-centered public process is conducted. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rebecca Simon, followed by Stephanie DeLucia. Hello, good morning. My name is Becca Simon and I'm project manager at Grounded Strategies. I'm representing the Get, Out, Get the Let Out Pittsburgh campaign. Um, and I'd like to thank the city council for allowing us to provide input on the allocation of ARPA funds. I would like to echo what everyone has been saying about the equity and um, hearing about these agenda funds and reallocation of funds. Uh, this funding has the potential to really make long-term positive changes in our city, especially when talking about the benefits of funding projects that focus on environmental and public health. We at Grounded Strategy support the efforts of the Get the Let Out campaign and their ordinance, and we agree with their emphasis on focusing on all sources of lead exposure, including paint, dust, and soil. As previously stated, lead-based paint and lead-contaminated dust are the most common sources of lead exposure in children in the U.S. and in Allegheny County. At Grounded, we see the risk most commonly while working with community members to revitalize city-owned and privately-owned vacant lots. Many vacant lots have high levels of lead in the soil, and this contamination is often found in vulnerable communities due to a lack of funding and high numbers of demolitions. Numerous lots were typically sites for houses containing lead-based paint, which can weather or flake off and contaminate the soil as homes are abandoned and deteriorating. When these homes are demolished and proper lead-safe wetting methods are not used, lead dust plumes can spread hazards as far as 400 feet away from the work site. Also, historically, debris from housing demolition was simply buried on these sites. These lots with high lead levels pose a threat to residents' health and safety. Contaminated soil can be tracked into homes, on shoes and clothing, or can even be blown in as dust and ingested. Children playing on such lots could be putting contaminated soil in their mouths through normal hand-to-mouth -mouth behaviors. Lead, of course, cannot be seen, so a child may unknowingly be playing on a lot with lead contamination. And as we know, any level of lead exposure to a child is completely unsafe and could easily be prevented if we ensure funding to address all sources of lead exposure. We at Grounded believe this level of risk could be reduced drastically through a shift to a prevention model to address lead exposure and lead poisoning in children. We believe the ARPA fund should be directed towards safeguarded and preventive actions, including the inspection of rental homes and child-occupied facilities for lead paint, dust, and soil. Ensuring renovations and repairs permitted by the city are done in a lead-safe manner, finally conducting lead-safe demolitions. We stand with Get the Lead Out Pittsburgh in the need to prioritize this public health and justice issue in the process of deciding how ARPA funds will be allocated. These ARPA funds represent an opportunity for you, City Council, to follow through on your state intention and goal to prevent further lead poisoning in Pittsburgh. And we hope you consider allocating these funds to address all sorts of lead exposure. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stephanie DeLucia, followed by Lisa Gonzalez. Um, good morning, my name is Stephanie DeLucia. I am a director of a child development center in the city of Pittsburgh and also a parent in Ward 6 um, in Lawrenceville. Um, I've reached out to Women for Healthy Environment for the past five years on helping to remediate the lead exposure in our young children. Um, while the water is a start, it does not cover the full extent of the impact lead has on the smallest citizens in our community. Children are exposed to sources of lead during their everyday activities in all forms, water they drink, rooms they play in, soil they run in, and which in turn is brought back into their homes for additional prolonged exposure. I could go on about how lead affects children's nervous systems, causes behavior issues, and lowers their cognitive abil abilities, but I only know those things because of my profession. Without the organizations receiving funding to keep families notified of these risks, they will have no idea. As a family, we learned the risks at a farmer's, our local farmer's market. We followed up with soil testing in our own backyard and found out our soil was toxic. No, no people or animals should be in our own backyard. Uh, how many families in the Pittsburgh area are also facing this and not knowing? Um, had we not known, our child would be essentially poisoned just in her own backyard. Um, just think about how many children in Pittsburgh you can keep safe by allocating the ARPA funds to address the lead in all areas that children are affected by. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Gonzalez, fo followed by Amber Thompson. 
Uh, good morning. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I'm na my name is Lisa Gonzalez, and I live in Carrick. I, I just have a several uh, several questions. Where is the money to support the tenants? Where is the money to close the affordable housing gap? The housing crisis is only going to get worse. Kids are going to be put out on the streets. They're all stressed now because some of the parents are getting being evicted now. They're going not going to have nowhere to go. So I'm hoping you'll hold off on the vote and allocate some money so these kids who are going to be homeless and uh, maybe end of this month, they don't have parent people to go to live with. Then you have people moving out of state because there's no place to go. I went to a couple of housing, to the magistrates, to a couple of eviction courts. People were happy to see me because they didn't know what to do. But it's going to get worse. We need to move. Y'all need to uh, allocate some money to close this gap. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amber Thompson, followed by Alethea Sims. Good morning. Um, my name is Amber Thompson. I'm here as the budget engagement coordinator for the Economic Justice Circle. It's a grassroots coalition of community leaders, activists, organizers, and advocates committed to creating an economic justice agenda for the Pittsburgh region with a race and gender equity lens. We are building a cross movement, <clears throat> we are building cross movement solidarity that implement a strategy that centers the experiences and leadership of people who are affected by multiple systems of oppression throughout regional budgets. The city of Pittsburgh will receive over $300 million within the next two years as part of the American Rescue Plan. This is a huge influx of funds and I'm here today to ask city council to pause on voting for the proposed plan submitted by the current administration. The primary intention of the plan is to provide real equitable recovery for our communities. The funds are not earmarked for past debt or future debt. I'm presenting a petition with 120 organizations and individual residents that proposes the city of Pittsburgh immediately engage in a community driven transparent process for deciding how to spend these critical federal dollars. The city announced a task force to steward an equity first spending plan, but the task force has not ensured representation and input from the community. These are public dollars and a significant portion will be allotted to private entities without oversight or accountability to the communities that need it the most. It's time that we put our money where our values are. I'm also inviting you to join the Economic Justice Circle in the Equitable and Just Greater Pittsburgh's ARPA Education Forums on July 20th at 6.30 to listen to more community members regarding their vision for these funds. Not only community members, but community leaders have not been educated nor informed around these funds to even provide the feedback necessary to make these decisions today. We will follow up with your offices for registration information. Our city and county governments must prioritize the needs of communities historically left behind so that our neighborhoods can thrive. In order to build a city and county that works for all of us and our local governments, we must ensure a transparent, people-centered budget process and engaging the community first for community input. Thank you. Thank you. Our next registered speaker is Alethea Sims. However, I do not see her um, logged in yet. So we will move on to Brenda Harris and come back to Ms. Sims as she logs on. Is Brenda Harris with us? I do not see Brenda Harris with us. So our next registered speaker would be Helen Gearhart, followed by Kai Jackson. Is Ms. Gearhart with us? Thank you. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm very concerned that this, um, this budget was not developed with the, um, the incredible problem-solving abilities, the cooperative efforts 
of uh, people, organizations, institutions, representatives uh, from across the city. We are an ecosystem in which our various uh, systems, economies, struggles, whether it's in um, transportation, air and water quality, housing, food systems, they are deeply interrelated and they need the full deliberative capacities that we have as a community. Um, this was rushed out in such a way that it does not allow uh, full participation in ways that would benefit us all, especially as we face the escalating impacts of climate changes, including extensive damages and breakdowns uh, to our various community systems. I want to uplift just one example, um, the role of nutrition uh, in COVID. COVID is a clear uh, impact of climate change. There are, and food systems are breaking down across the world in, uh, as we face climate change. We in this region have uh, the opportunity to invest an enormous amount of these funds that were, are, are meant to be addressed to COVID emergency, COVID emergency impacts. Um, to really address the long-standing role of nutrition in um, disease, disability, um, high infant mortality, death rates within black communities. We could invest in a, a long-term address of those, those systemic problems, as well as the, uh, the particular impacts of nutrition um, on COVID itself. COVID has been shown to be uh, very um, much more damaging to people who do not have proper nutrition, um, who uh, the death rates go up, especially for people who have not had access to healthy food. Um, so along with many others, I strongly urge that the city invest in um, uh, the establishment of a Pittsburgh Food Justice Fund with at least an investment of $10 million. This fund will increase our abilities, our city's ability to really bring the community together and strengthen all different aspects of our, of our current food system and of the inequities which have damaged um, disinvested communities, black communities, people with disabilities, so many of the people that should be protected classes under civil rights law. Thank you. Our next speaker that is with us is Dave Brennigan, followed by Randall Taylor. Hi, my name is Dave Bringen. I'm the executive director of Lawrenceville United and a resident of Lower Lawrenceville. I'm here to echo uh, many of the calls of my colleagues um, that these funds prioritize equity and racial justice in their deployment, um, encourage council to pause the vote so that we can have a transparent and authentic process of community engagement. And I'll just underscore to Something that we see uh, really strongly here in Lawrenceville, the need for affordable housing and underscoring the point that Celeste Scott made that the housing crisis in Pittsburgh is felt deepest at the lowest income levels. This has only been exacerbated by the pandemic. And so I want to stress the need for housing funds to prioritize our lowest income renters um, and to address the ways that groups have historically been excluded and discriminated against in Pittsburgh. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Randall Taylor. Can you hear me, Councilman? Yes, I can. Uh, I echo to other speakers that this process should be stopped. Um, no vote should be taken. Um, 
I do not understand what is happening with this with this city council at this moment. I do understand the pressures of a councilman under a mayor strong city, but uh, Mayor Peduto was defeated. The voters said they do not want his vision for the future. And so we should start there. Um, this process, of course, is, is really laughable that we would not take advantage of all the talents, all the universities uh, in this city to talk about the amazing opportunities that we have. If you have not even as council people engaged your district and let them know these funds are here and solicit ideas from them, that should be reason enough right there. And if you have engaged your district, I would like to hear some of the suggestions that they had. Uh, as, a, as an old history student from the University of Pittsburgh, always a question was, do we understand history when we're actually living in that moment? I think we do, but I don't think at this moment that city council has grasped the gravity of this moment, that your decision potentially on, on Wednesday will affect generations to come. We have an opportunity to do something great with these dollars. We, many people have addressed many issues that we have the dollars to address. We can talk about clean energy. Why can't Pittsburgh own their own wind farm and cut the cost uh, of, of energy uh, for, our, for our residents? Why can't we talk about food cooperatives mm -hmm. for our people? Why can't we talk about a public bank so we can begin to put those profits that are going into these big corporations back into the hands of our working families? We have an opportunity here. Affordable housing, we should not walk away from this without a community like home would transform. We have fought for years and all we've heard from the city is we don't have the money. Oh, we're, we're broke. Um, uh, oh, it'll cost a hundred million dollars to rebuild homes. And now we have the opportunity to do it and we're not. That, that to me is, is, is absolutely really crazy, but it is really a lost opportunity uh, for our city and for our future. We have an opportunity to build a brand new Pittsburgh. The public does not know this money is here, council. They do not know. And it was your responsibility to inform them that this amazing once in a lifetime opportunity is here. So I will see you again on Monday. I hope that was more positive, but on Monday, we're gonna talk about reparations and what this city has, what this council, this body has historically done to the African-American community stretching back over uh, 60 years. So again, we'll have a different conversation on Monday. So again, please, please, please do not vote on this illegitimate process. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker that is with us is Don Plummer which will be followed by Brendan Delaney. Thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, my name is Dawn Plummer. I live in the District 9 and serve as the Executive Director of the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council. I wanna to touch on two pieces here this morning. One is around process and timeline, and the second is on the content of our proposal for food justice. Um, first, uh, we call on council to pause the vote until an equitable people-centered process can occur. There's been a tremendous amount of work in the region as others have referred to um, that can inform this project process. We need a public conversation on this once in a generation investment into our communities. We need time for public examination and public conversation on all of the proposals put forward, those put, put forward by city staff, as well as those put forward by community members and others. The proposal itself being just released days ago, uh, the, the post agenda session that I watched at one, one o'clock in the morning last night, and these public hearings can all happen within one week when someone might be away reuniting with family, et cetera, and to miss an opportunity uh, to participate here and understand these critical and complex issues would be a shame. Proceeding at warp speed, despite uh, just, uh, Proceeding at warp speed would be a disservice to those of our community members who have been working hard in our farms and gardens around the clock, distributing emergency food and reopening in dining restaurants. These folks have not had the time or attention to understand this historic opportunity, and that's why we need a public process. It's clear that the city must act quickly. However, uh, 
uh, as Chief Gilman mentioned himself, these are all discretionary funds. None of this is mandated spending. This is discretionary $335 million coming to our city, which is nearly 60% of our city's annual budget. This is a significant amount of money. Um, in reviewing the federal guidance, there's no rush timeline. There's no need for a four-year spending proposal. They're only required to have a periodic report and a deadline to obligate funds by December 31st, 2024. So we need to understand the facts of the decisions around which the decisions we're making are. are, are. Um, on, in terms of putting food on the table, how do we look at this pandemic? We know in Pittsburgh that we've been hit hard. Our systems are breaking down, as Helen mentioned earlier. The Food Policy Council has released a proposal calling for a $10 million investment. This is a mere 3% of these relief funds to be invested in the city's capacity to lead on food systems initiatives. We have many leaders in our city, but we need our city itself to lead um, and to establish a Pittsburgh Food Justice Fund. We uh, commend the efforts dedicating past CARES Act and, and CDBG support to some of our region's largest emergency food providers. Um, and now is time to support our robust food systems innovators and champions as well. Um, we must invest proactively in our food systems infrastructure to build community resilience, economic stability, and public health of all Pittsburghers, to cut into the root causes of hunger and insecurity, and not only provide dollars to feed, to feed the hungry once the devastation has already hit. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brendan Delaney, followed by Mark Brentley Sr. Hello, my name is Brendan Delaney. I'm a resident of Brighton Heights and I am the vice president of the Brighton Heights Citizens Federation. Uh, I'm here to speak today about one aspect of the proposed funding, which is the funding of the Davis Avenue Bridge. Um, for those of you who are unaware, um, since 2009, 2009, the Davis Avenue Bridge was imploded and it essentially cut off a key link between Riverview Park and our neighborhood, as well as Brightwood and other parts of the North Side. So since 2009, we've basically been able to see Riverview Park um, as it sits there, but not really access it in any sort of practical way. Um, this has been a huge issue for our community. Anytime we've had put, uh, potential discussion of the Davis Avenue Bridge, uh, it's always cr created a lot of interest. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to the bridge potentially being, re being rebuilt. Um, money's been taken from what was allocated for it and other things. Uh, but we finally seen the light of the tunnel at the end of the tunnel on this. And uh, I understand the, some of the complaints about community input. Um, but I will tell you that this community and everything that I've heard from the community um, favors this. And we really ask that uh, the funding for the Davis Avenue Bridge go forward because we don't want to wait another 12 years um, to potentially have the bridge rebuilt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mark Brentley Sr followed by Dave Civic. Good morning, council members. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me first off, it seems like the last primary election was the year of the woman in terms of their, their uh, progress that they're making in politics. So let me start off by thanking two women. The first one would be Councilwoman Deb Gross. Uh, thank you so much for your leadership on this issue. You at least had the leadership uh, abilities to speak to it publicly, to let uh, the public know that there should be some public involvement. So for that alone, I wanna say thank you for that. The second woman that I would like to thank is uh, KDKA's talk show host, Lynn Hayes Freeland, who has boldly said today, at five o'clock, 10.20 a.m. on KDKA, she will talk about this very, very historic issue. So thank you to both of you. Uh, to the members of council, I just wanna encourage you to vote no on this legislation. Please do not force this thing through. Let's not forget that whatever actions you take in the next couple of weeks, you're off for the entire month of August. So if the public is outraged or have questions, comments, or concerns, you're unavailable. And so it doesn't look good, okay? And so I'm strongly encouraging you not to do that. But I also wanna remind your listeners that uh, I spent 16 years on the Pittsburgh School Board, elected school board, volunteer uh, basis, but we fought often 
usually along the lines of race. But you know, there was one unwritten thing that we kind of, sort of agreed on. And that was, if you were an outgoing school board member, you always had enough respect to never vote on a major issue to, uh, that was coming up that it would allow your incoming school board member to make. For instance, the vote on a superintendent. I served under four different superintendents, so I voted on those four or five different superintendents. But when they had the last superintendent, I had to vote and I made the comments on the floor to the respect of my incoming school board member that I would not do that. And so that's the kind of professional courtesy I think most of you should exercise. And that is, why would you spend and make decisions now and force the incoming administration to manage it, to monitor it, and to try to see through what you put in place? Politically, it's a little unfair. It almost suggests that some of us may be uh, doing it for different reasons. I don't know if that's the case, but I would just simply encourage you uh, not to do it. Finally, I wanted to say briefly, uh, this American Rescue uh, Plan can be a very key thing here in the community. Some of us are looking at the impact of African Americans. We are on the bottom list of damn near everything in this city, from housing to employment and to the violence in our community. And so we're looking at this as the African Rescue Plan. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dave Civic, followed by Lisa Freeman. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. My name is Dave Civic. I'm here as the Executive Director of Computer Reach, based in Wilkinsburg. We provide internet, computers, and support services to Pittsburgh residents. Computer Reach believes that everyone, regardless of income, age, education, in language must be connected to the internet with a working computer. Pittsburghers need to understand how to access healthcare, food, banking, and workforce development material. And Pittsburghers need to understand online privacy. Digital equality means that all Pittsburghers have access to Recovery Act funds to fund the expansion of person-to-person, one-to-one computer support. To that end, we formed the Pittsburgh Digital Inclusion Coalition in partnership with leaders of communities such as age-friendly, older adults, libraries, schools, housing authorities, neighborhoods, and youth programs. These Public Recovery Act dollars must be allocated for the public good. People are infrastructure. Our Pittsburgh Digital Inclusion and Coalition engages local government leaders and community foundations to secure the funding to pay for digital navigators, a specially trained frontline computer support team that meets people where they are with technology, regardless of the challenge. We know that the barriers of cost and transportation are significant, especially for non-English speakers. We know that scheduling computer support around work, school, and childcare responsibilities is challenging. We know that being disconnected from our digital world can be a major financial disadvantage. COVID-19 taught us that fact. Our city and county governments must prioritize the needs of individuals in communities. It's not fair to wish people good luck figuring out how to use a computer on the internet. With ransomware and other scams, they can have their entire financial, uh, their entire finances compromised. So in closing, Computer Reach and our, close, and our colleagues at the Pittsburgh Digital Inclusion Coalition know how to reach train and protect Pittsburghers. Please listen to us. Please support us with Recovery Act funds. I'm gonna close with one example that happened yesterday. I stopped at Home Depot in East Liberty asking a question about adapting a 220 volt and a 110 plug. The staff person at Home Depot in the electronics department was calm, clear, and did not make me feel stupid for asking a, a basic question. It's the same way with people who need help with the internet. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lisa Freeman, followed by Erica Payne. Let me 
Ms. Freeman was with us. Sorry, can you hear me now? Thank yes, you, please. Manchester. I agree with uh, all the hard work that you've done, uh, but I wanted to add some more uh, consideration. There's some populants in our great city of Pittsburgh that didn't get as much relief as some others. The, eight, the, demographic, that, the demographics that I'd like you to consider that were aged 18 to 25 are young adults, um, are mid-age workers, 40 to 65, and then single, single people without children. They didn't get as much relief as some others. So I, I'd ask that you, in all your consideration, be creative in how we can address those demographics. Equity. All the money that you've had uh, allocated to the different uh, categories, I agree with. But I want to also add the mandate that in that designation, 20% 20, 20 should be set aside for a relationship that those categories have to make with their local communities that they serve. And that 20% should be collaborations and relationships that they have to uh, reach out to the people in the neighborhood programs, people, groups that do the out on ground work that they reach out and become uh, uh, their onus to de develop those relationships. The lost revenue, uh, you had that category. Affordable housing indeed is a big issue. And those, we have residents here who are uh, uh, delayed payments in home uh, mortgages and rent. But then we also have that group who have sacrificed and made those mortgage payments and went without a whole lot of stuff. But now we're stuck and I include myself in that group. Now we're stuck. I paid my mortgage. But the one thing I was unable to pay were taxes. And so now I'm delinquent for two years. I think that lost revenue, you have room and capacity to develop some kind of resource for people who fall in that category. And generally, that's the people 40 to 60. Um, $10 million, your line item, I think that's resolution 1656. I'm not sure. But there is no funding for food. And I see Ms. Freeman still highlighted, but we cannot hear her. I think you mute, accidentally muted yourself, Ms. Freeman. No. We can hear you now. I'm sorry, I don't, my screen went blank. But the, the line item, item of $10 million, there is no food item. And people, we've got USDA and the federal level have increased food stamps participation and uh, uh, increased the uh, opportunity for people. But in the same token, the prices, have you looked in the grocery stores? $1.99 for ribs two weeks ago jumped up to $5.99 last week. So there's price gouging on. The amount of benefit that they, the, the federal government has given to us as, as citizens, they've taken away with the cost of food. Okay, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Erica Payne, followed by Ann Wright. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Erica Payne. I am a social worker and born and bred in the city. Uh, I live in Shar City right now. Um, I just got this proposal last night, so I'm probably going to echo a lot of what everyone else, all the former speakers were saying, but uh, looking at it, there were like five issues that I wanted to highlight. Uh, first, uh, there's very little in this proposal about COVID relief, which I believe is the purpose of these funds. Most of it, well, after we take care of the city employees, which I'm, I'm perfectly in, in favor for, most of, the most of the funds seem to go to capital projects of some kind. I, I, I'm still seeing, uh, I mean, it might be a good idea to do that, but I, I still see that we are dealing with a lot of hunger, uh, evictions, uh, small businesses are folding and medium-sized businesses. Um, I would like the council to entertain more ideas from the community advocates about how that 
to allocate this money to meet our needs. Um, the second problem is that there's so little guidance from the funds. Like I just got this information last night and as you know, a, a resident of the city, uh, there was really no input. Nobody even told us that this meeting was going to be happening. Um, there's, I believe that it says, the guidance says that, you know, there should be extensive community input and what we have instead are two hasty arranged Zoom meetings followed by an immediate vote. So it appears as if our input is completely irrelevant. Okay, so the third is this huge amount of money that's being handed to outside organizations like the URA which if you know the residents do vote for that's perfectly fine but the problem is that uh these you know uh, organizations have no accountability to the public through any elected representative and so it just gives rise to you know the perception that the outgoing admin is taking this money to fund pet projects really we need to be looking at our most vulnerable populations and that would be seniors, disabled and children which take up almost two thirds of our city. I am particularly troubled by the 2.5 million grant that's going to one Pittsburgh. That's a private entity of Mayor Peduto. I, I haven't seen any track record of this uh, organization of this nonprofit uh, achieving anything. Um, if the city wants to run a guaranteed income experiment, please uh, do so or uh, through a proven partner. But we want to see some accountability for where a lot of this money is going. So Thank you. Our next speaker is Ann Wright, followed by Richard Schwartz. Hi, thank you. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Ann Wright. I live in South Oakland, and I've put a lot of effort into monitoring evictions, uh, including sending about 2,000 mailers since September to Pittsburgh residents involved in evictions, informing them about moratoriums, rental assistance, and other measures that can help stabilize their, their families and their homes. The city eviction moratorium was signed on March 5th, 2021. Since then, despite both the city and CDC moratoriums being in effect, 143 households have had orders for possession issued in Pittsburgh serving magisterial districts. Another 246 have had their cases judged for the landlord in that time and haven't yet had an order for possession issued. The 70% of them that didn't file an appeal, plus those who already exist, exhausted their appeal, could have an order for possession issued any time, be on the curb and be on the curb 10 days after that. Another 305 have had evictions filed on them and are awaiting hearings currently. This is with both the federal and city moratorium in effect. Imagine how much worse this is going to get when those protections end. And the truth is their chances of finding another unit they can afford are extremely slim. The supply of affordable housing options is insufficient and the availability is at a historic low. Waiting lists for existing affordable units are very long. Even those few who do manage to have a chance at subsidized housing, such as um, a housing choice voucher, are extremely unlikely to find a landlord who will take them, uh, particularly with an eviction on the record. Shelters are hard to get into and spaces can't be reserved in advance. For those who are not able to find and be accepted for new housing in time, will end up street homeless. Dealing with all of this is very traumatizing. This process contributes significantly to racial inequities in the city. Black households, particularly female household uh, led households with children are the group most impacted by this. According to Pittsburgh's 2019 inequality across gender and race report, Inequities by both race and gender are higher in Pittsburgh than in other similar cities. These inequities have a huge impact on who can and who can't sustainably pay rent, and those who can't are subject to eviction and potential homelessness. For example, 62% of the heads of household for the ERAP program for whom race is known are Black, though only 13% of the population of the county are. 71% of the heads of household are female, and 44% of these families have children. These disparities of access to stable housing further deepen existing inequities. The American Rescue Plan funds are a historic opportunity to make real impact in improving equity of access to safe and stable housing. We need to create at least 17,000 more sustainably affordable units in the next four years. The plan as currently formulated is not in line with that goal. We can do better. 
please delay the vote and modify the plan to meaningfully address these inequities. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Richard Swartz, followed by Sam Applefield. Thank you for the opportunity to address uh, City Council today. I had a set of prepared remarks, but after hearing the previous testimony, I thought I would scrap those and make some suggestions to City Council as to how it might move forward. Uh, I'm not a City Council person, so uh, I'm a lay person. But what I would do if I were a City Council person, I would certainly fund the uh, lost revenue uh, uh, amounts shown for 2021 and 2022. I know it's going to be slow emerging from COVID over the next year. So laying in those funds today or in the next week uh, would not be a bad idea. What I would encourage council to do is after you've put aside about 117 million for those lost revenues for 2021 and 2022, I would take the remaining 217 million and I would divide that three ways. I would put aside a third for looking at 2023 and 2024 from an operating standpoint. That might mean 35 million per year for each of those two out years. I think the amounts that have been uh, recommended by the administration are higher than what will ultimately be necessary. I would then put another 70 million aside and allow for community input into uh, community public health, safety, water quality, environmental remediation, food insecurity, and landslide remediation. So 70 million goes into that category. And that's a category that I think would invite uh, a lot of organizations to the table to help decide what are the priorities for spending those funds. The final 70 million, I would dedicate for investments in communities and populations hit hardest by COVID. You've heard some of that testimony today, affordable housing development, home repair loans. This is missing from the current proposal. The URA has no money today for home repair loans for low income homeowners, along with small business assistance and ongoing help to renters who are facing possible eviction. So those are the uh, tranches that I would create if I were council uh, passed the bill on Wednesday to fund operations for 2021, 2022, even set aside 35 million for each of 2023 and 2024. But then let's have a larger community discussion about the other 140 million. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sam Applefield, followed by Aikuhana Hamakina. Good morning. My name is Sam Applefield. For the last three years, I have worked to engage constituents, businesses, and food and farm organizations across the city in the development of the Greater Pittsburgh Food Action Plan, our region's first comprehensive food systems plan. I'd like to share some background on that plan and explain why the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council is now calling for the creation of a $10 million food justice fund with the American Rescue Plan Act money. Starting in 2019, we developed a diverse project team made up of community leaders, business owners, academic partners, city agencies, urban gardeners, and public health officials. This team meant monthly to guide the development of the plan which included an immense amount of research, as well as community engagement sessions, online surveys, and stakeholder roundtables. In total, more than 600 people contributed to the development of this plan, which was released in the fall of 2020 and outlines 150 strategies to strengthen the food system in Allegheny County. For many of these strategies, the people, the organizations, the motivation are all in place. All that is needed is a financial investment. For example, strategy 3.12.2 of the plan is to develop grants, incentives, and other economic supports from the city and county government for healthy food retail businesses. Our partners at Just Harvest and Bridgeway Capital are doing great work to advance this strategy, building a network of a dozen corner stores that they have supported to carry and market fresh produce. However, they are limited in the financial support they can provide and the number of stores they can reach. 
There are hundreds of corner stores across the city that could benefit from small scale investment. Just $15,000, for example, can cover the cost of refrigeration, point of sale upgrades, marketing materials, and other needs for these stores to carry produce. This investment supports small locally owned businesses, creates a, creates a new fresh produce access point for thousands of residents, and creates new market opportunities for small scale growers in our, in our city. Similar high impact investments can be made in farmers markets, community gardens, food business development, and food access programming. We have a plan developed with years of work and voices of hundreds of city residents to guide investments in our local food system. We need you to recognize the transformative impact this kind of investment can have and support our local food systems development. That is why we are asking for a $10 million food justice fund to invest in the critical infrastructure required to put food on the table for all Pittsburghers. Finally, I encourage you to consider not only this fund in the final allocations for the American Rescue Plan, but also the voices and ideas of others who have spoken here today. There's no need to rush to a decision about these funds, so please slow the process down and make sure that the people of Pittsburgh who these funds are supposed to support have a voice in saying how they should be used. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Aikuhana Haumalkina, followed by Brooke Lou Duplantier. Greetings and good day. Thank you, City Council members, for providing this platform for the people's voices to be heard. My title is Ikahana Hal Makina. I am the Grand Inca of the Iroquois Confederacy of Aborigine American People, and I am the voice of the Indigenous people here in this region. I am calling for City Council to conduct town hall meetings in the Southern region in the eastern region, in the western region, in the northern region, in the central region of this area of Pittsburgh. In order to engage the community, in order to hear feedback from the community, in order to inform the community that these funds exist. These funds are allocated $335 million have been allocated to relieve the people of this region. Give relief to the people who have struggled through this pandemic, the essential workers who have never seen a dime of relief money because corporate interest has always found ways to keep their funds for the elite. These funds need to be allocated to homeowners and renters who have struggled through this pandemic to make much needed repairs to their homes that they can't afford because of the economy has been stagnated due to this pandemic. To address homelessness, to address imminent home homelessness, to give vouchers to the parents who couldn't work because they're stuck at home with their children through this pandemic. Give vouchers to the students whose teachers failed them for tutoring services. And also community gardens, larger community gardens that teach the youth how to farm. So they can pass that on down for generations to come. So they have the wisdom to feed themselves, to feed their communities that are vested into their community. You have large plots of land, the city of Pittsburgh does, that has been sitting vacant, unused, land that could be toiled for growing of food. The Department of Mobility needs to address and wants to address the concerns of people who don't have automobiles but also the city of Pittsburgh has pushed to remove what they deemed as vacant automobiles on the streets without referring to their own home rule charter to consult the people before removing these automobiles off of the street, which has caused a deficit for people to take care of their own family. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brooke, Brooke Lou Duplanter. Hope I didn't pronounce that too wrong. Followed by 
Joanna McAllister Erickson. Joanna, excuse me. Hi there, my name is Brooke Lude Planchet. Um, I'd just like to echo the call to stop this process and to support our food system with this funding. This summer, I'm a Common Threads nutrition educator for K through five students at PPS Boost Summer Camp, where I share with kids how to build healthy food habits and lifestyles. And a lot of the time it feels a bit pointless to teach 10 year olds about what foods are best for them when they have little to no control over what they eat at home and at school. Their families may even have little control over their food choices, given the lack of available food and healthy resources in many of my students' communities, communities which were devastated by COVID. And just yesterday, after I finished running a lesson about foods that give us energy for our bodies and minds, the students were sent home with their free summer snack, a bag of Chips Ahoy chocolate chip cookies. They deserve better from their city. Whatever statistics you have about food insecurity in Pittsburgh, which was as high as 20% during the pandemic, should be doubled to get a closer number to the amount of families that lack the resources to build healthy, nutritious diets and lifestyles. As the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council has proposed, investing just $10 million in a Pittsburgh food justice fund is investing in the future of Pittsburgh. It's an investment in racial justice and equity and it's overdue and it's necessary given the ongoing impact of COVID on food security. It is outrageous to me that Mayor Perduto's plan that is supposed to quote, invest in people does not center the drastic need for affordable nutritious food. And to truly quote, invest in place and planet, there must be direct funding to community gardens, local food and farmer initiatives and job creation in our food system. As Sam just told us, the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council has done a lot of this work for you. Their recent Greater Pittsburgh Food Action Plan is a starting point for creating a Pittsburgh of health and equity. A fund that would give just $10 million out of your 335 million presents the city of Pittsburgh with an opportunity to join local food system development, which in turn will supply more food security and sovereignty to our city. Therefore, please delay this vote for this proposal and to receive greater community feedback and have the time to consider establishing a food justice fund and have at the very least included more funding for the most basic human rights, food, housing, and water in your plans. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jonah McAllister Erickson, followed by Ziggy Edwards. Hi, thank you. My name is Jonah McAllister Erickson. I'm a um, resident of Bloomfield and uh, I'll keep my comments relatively short. I think the major issue here is the process and timeline. This is a extremely rushed process for presenting a huge amount of spending that could transform the city uh, in many different positive ways. And yet what we've seen is a, is a rushed process, not a people-centered process that's deliberative and has consulted with the residents of the city of Pittsburgh to say, how do we want to spend this money? What kinds of change do we want to see? Uh, instead, it's advancing the status quo and the special interests of the Lane Duck administration. Um, again, we need a, a slow, deliberative, public, people-centered process uh, to, to make this really something that, that can make lasting change in the city of Pittsburgh and not something that's pushed through uh, at warp speed. I also would like to note, uh, I've been following city council. I'm a lifelong Pittsburgh resident and I've attended hundreds of city council meetings. This is the first time I remember there being a council hearing uh, on a Saturday morning, which I think is positive, right? Because the regular council meetings aren't that accessible for working people. Uh, but that also says something about the speed and, and hurried nature of getting this through is that the council felt it was necessary to have a special meeting on a Saturday, something that I've never seen before. And so I think we need to slow this down. Council should certainly spend money to stop layoffs of city employees, but the rest of the funds, we should have a people-centered process on how to spend them. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ziggy Edwards, followed by Nthando Wandwi. Hello, can you all hear me, council members? Yes. Great, thank you. My name is Ziggy Edwards and I live in the run. I'm here to say it's unconscionable that the city of Pittsburgh is getting ready to spend this $335 million of American Rescue Plan public money with zero public input. 
Pittsburghers have pressing specific needs this money can address that you've heard about, such as affordable housing, affordable transit, food access, and relief from natural disasters like landslides and flooding that hit people especially hard when they're already struggling as a result of COVID-19. I implore you to listen to my fellow Pittsburghers when they ask for things like emergency fare relief for low-income transit riders and help for tenants that doesn't exist in Mayor Peduto's current plan. Um, and you could even take a minute to read um, the Our Money, Our Solutions petition, uh, which I'm gonna take a minute and read out the, the uh, URL since my remarks are short, actionnetwork.org slash petitions slash our dash money dash our solutions. Um, my neighbors and I directed this petition at city council several years ago. So you would redirect funds from the controversial monocline connector plan to priorities we ourselves identified for our communities. This is just an example of the fact that our neighborhoods don't need more boondoggles designed to benefit outside investors. We, all of us in the city of Pittsburgh deserve a public process and for our ideas to be heard about how to spend money in our communities. It's bad enough that every current and future American is on an eternal hook for these funds being spent, most of which have already been handed off to multinational corporations and the largest ever transfer of wealth. Surely city council can understand why we're beyond insulted that Mayor Peduto skipped any public process in favor of a quote task force to decide where to direct the sliver of our own money that's purported to help us. Our other cities have shown by providing ample time for public input on the use of these ARP funds that there is no need to rush to spend them or falsely claim that we must use them or lose them. And it's, I'm sorry to say, but it's exactly this kind of anti-democratic MO that got Mayor Peduto voted out in May. And I hope all you council members take heed of that. Um, I'm asking city council to stop the vote on these ARP resolutions, begin a true pu public process for allocation and invest directly in people's emergency needs. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nthando Thandwi, followed by Felicia Bute. Uh, hi, my name is Nthando. Um, I live in Bloomfield. I'm a budget and policy analyst at the Pittsburgh Budget and Policy Center. I'm here to talk about the American Rescue Plan um, and the lack of public, meaningful uh, public engagement and transparency and the missed opportunity of the proposed spending plan to truly address the existing inequities that have been made worse by the pandemic. Um, in its release of the uh, US Treasury guidance, it explicitly guides um, localities to have an open process that includes residents and seizing this historic opportunity to not only engage their constituents and communities in developing plans to use these payments, but also, you know, given the scale and funding and its potential to catalyze broader economic recovery and rebuilding. Uh, the Treasury also says that, you know, to use to target um, these resources to households and businesses and nonprofits. Um, and communities that are most dispor disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Uh, me. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh has received 335 million in ARP funds, which is nearly 60% of the city's yearly operating budget. And the Pittsburgh Task Force legislation committed itself to using a racial equity lens and to develop an equity first spending plan to address the city's division between the rich and the poor. However, this spending plan, you know, has no community input to this process the hearings today and Monday were announced with less than a week's notice. Um, the public plan that's that was released is a two and a half page spreadsheet with about 10 to five words describing the allocations up to 112 million. And the information now public makes it impossible to evaluate if the plan lives up to its task force on equities charge. 70% of funding uh, going to lost revenue, including 174 million uh, in 2022 to 2024, um, and which time in the future uh, city revenues may be at pre-pandemic levels, um, the city's allocation plan appears to use this ARP money to compensate for ongoing revenue shortfalls. Um, the city's failure to raise adequate uh, revenues from richer and large institutions in Pittsburgh. Right. To enact, an ARP allocation plan consistent with federal guidance and uh, recovery task force, uh, city council should pause on voting 
the proposed ARP plan. Take a close look at this lost revenue al allocations, uh, develop a fair taxation plan, and create a real plan for community-based uh, input that really takes into account feedback and engages in general dialogue with city leaders and not just the three-minute comment slots that we have right now. Additionally, the ARP plan as is does not address a lot of the aspects that people spoke on today. Food quality access, emergency fare relief, uh, assistance to renters and homeowners. Um, we need to... Our next speaker is Felicia Boutte, followed by Joseph Thomas Glassbringer. Good morning, City Council people, and uh, I want to uh, take this time to thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm a resident of the Regent Square area and recently have been uh, affected by um, the last severe storms in our area, the severe tree loss and power losses in our area as well. Having said that, this is a critical point in the city of Pittsburgh and the Wilkinsburg area and surrounding communities in addressing climate change or climate crisis. As I look at this opportunity, I realized, like so many other speakers, that this is a difficult point for leadership in the region with this new opportunity to look at the future of our city, not only as it affects climate change, but also the recent impact of COVID-19. I regret, like so many other speakers, that this is with a limited amount of city participation. Those 38 speakers was pretty impressive on a Saturday morning. But I think there is a need to look at each community and the crisis in, in those communities as it relates to COVID and climate. The city has been in a very rare position in the sense that there were needs to be addressed even when there wasn't revenue to address those needs. And all of the speakers before have educated all of us of how many volunteers and how many people are out there behind the scenes helping to keep this community going through the COVID crisis and climate crisis. And I wanna thank every one of them and you as leaders. But I too, like so many of my previous speakers, agree that this is not enough time to figure out the best strategy for this fund, funding source. I appreciate the fact that you've given us the opportunity to speak to you, but I also know that in this process, we need to address the future, not the past. Um, I initially signed up with the understanding that I would support uh, $10 million for a land bank, which was committed under the Peduto administration. And not to anyone's surprise, it has not been fulfilled um, as an actual program in the administration. And Thank you. Our next speaker is Joseph Thomas Glassbury, followed by Marquis Stansberry. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, thanks. I appreciate the uh, time to speak today on the neighborhood of Brighton Heights. So my name is Joseph Glassbrenner. I am the president of the Brighton Heights Citizens Federation Community Group. Uh, we are a registered community organization with the city of Pittsburgh. 
And today I'm speaking from our community office at 3629 California Avenue with uh, 16 other residents of Brighton Heights who are here to express their approval and vote in support of council's vote in favor of the presented allocations from the Federal American Rescue Plan. The funding for the Davis Avenue Bridge pedestrian bridge is a community necessity and not only for our residents of Brighton Heights, but our bordering community neighborhoods of uh, Marshall Shadeland, Brightwood, Observatory Hill, Perry Hilltop, and Perrysville Avenue. The bridge will not only increase accessibility for Riverview Park for the residents of Brighton Heights and Marshall Shadeland, but it's going to allow greater access for residents to walk to Perry High School for sports, school, and extracurricular activities. These activities are going to keep our teens and young adults occupied with a safe and healthy activity, as well as the use of Riverview Park swimming pool for recreation in the summer. Um, some of the residents aren't able to access the Jack Stack pool it's because it's at the top of the Benton and that's a very large hill for them to walk. So it's gonna make it a lot more accessible and allow us to achieve more access to our amenities that are already invested in and in place. The completion of the funding for the Davis Avenue Bridge also will provide a conduit for other communities to access our Brighton Heights Business District. Our business district has the ability to provide residents with access to a community drugstore of Rite Aid, a fresh meat market, Tom Fridays, a variety of church congregations, and many joint community initiatives that we organize. The project would support the number three principle of the DOMI Department of Mobility and Infrastructures 2070 mobility vision. The number three principle is to create less than one mile access by walking to many necessities and amenities. The bridge already has the support of letters of support by our elected state representative, Emily Kincaid, city council person, Bobby Wilson, as well as an initial support grant of $500,000 from the state that has been awarded. The last piece to completing this project will be the support of all city council members for the vote of the allocations and approval of this spending. I thank everyone for their time today and I would look forward to seeing you again on Monday. Thank you. Our last registered speaker is Marquis Stansberry. Yes, thank you, uh, Daniel. My name is Mark Stansberry with the Jasmine Nairi campus in Sheridan and I want to uh, strongly and proudly vote in, uh, to, um, for the city council to move forward uh, with uh, their plan. Uh, Sheridan has waited a long time and now's the time to deliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that does exhaust our list of registered speakers. I would like to remind the public that again on Monday, um, July 12th at 6 p.m., we will have another public hearing where everyone can register to speak and be heard. Um, having exhausted the business of this public hearing, unless there are comments from members, we will adjourn. Are there any members who wanna provide comment? Seeing none, need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second it. Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned, thank you all.